Uh, I'm Ian Coley. I'm the director of engineering at Ink Tank. We're the company behind Ceph. Um, I'm going to be talking about Ceph and woo, Cloud Stack. Sorry, did you get a picture of me behind here? I know I'm being a little frazzled. I walk around a lot when I talk. Um, what I'm going to try to cover quickly, because I had some technical difficulties with the integration between Microsoft and Apple, is how to integrate Ceph and Cloud Stack. Here's a little bit about me. Um, the slides will be available. If you want to contact me, feel free to tweet me at IR Coley. I also sit on IRC, either one of those, IR Coley. All right. Can I just get a hand? How many people currently have running implementations of Ceph? OK. How many people have heard of Ceph? How many people have no idea what you're in for right now? Be honest. It's OK. All right. So Ceph is unified object block and file storage. I'll go into a little bit about the architecture with the, the time that we have. But what it does is provide you block, which you're extremely interested in in a cloud environment, but also object. So you don't have to get block from one provider, object from another. And then also a POSIX file system layer. A little bit about Ceph was started back in 2004, open sourced in 2006. Then it really started to pick up when it was picked up in the, uh, the accelerate when it was picked up in the Linux kernel in 2010. And then in 2012, it was integrated in both CloudStack and OpenStack. So we've been integrated since 4.0. What is, what is the purpose behind Ceph? Sage Weil, the, the father of Ceph, his, his dream was to basically take away the power of proprietary storage. Um, no offense if anyone's in here from EMC and NetApp, but um, he really despises all the vendor lock-in. And his dream was to allow people the freedom to choose whatever storage they wanted. If you're a Dell shop, if you're an HP shop, whatever you are, to allow you to switch out the hardware underneath and not feel like you were going to have to sacrifice in availability and reliability when you did that. So moving the smarts out of the RAID and the hardware and putting it into your software. And that's why the design of Ceph is built upon the idea that your storage is going to fail you at the hardware layer. Whoa. All right. Looks like their Wi-Fi is determined to get me to connect. How about there? And the, the reason this is so good for an exascale size project is when you think about having thousands of terabytes of data, or even thousands of petabytes of storage, just do the MTBF numbers, you're going to get failures all the time. So with the underlying architecture of Ceph, that failure is hidden from you. Again, community stuff, it's totally exploded since 2012. But let's talk more about the architecture. So we have underlying object storage demons that are one-to-one -one with each of your physical devices. Then we have these monitor nodes that sit out there monitoring the cluster, getting updates from the clients, getting updates from the, the OSDs saying, hey, I'm alive, hey, I'm dead. And they help give you a map of your cluster, of what's alive, what's dead, what state things are in. And all of, all of that then talks to the various levels. It's based all on the object storage, and then everything else goes on top of that. We'll see a better picture of that later. But first, I want to talk about, again, what makes Ceph special. And that's the CRUSH algorithm. CRUSH stands for Controlled Replication Using Scalable Hashing. And what that does is, so when you've got your object, and it hashes it in a pseudo-random manner, but it's deterministic. So you know that every time you run it through the CRUSH algorithm, whether you're on the client or the daemon, you're going to get this. So it's going to take this chunk right here, put it on this OSD. That's what each of these squares stand for. And given your replication rules, and here I've given it a replication rule of one, so I've got one original and one copy. It's going to put one of them there and one of them here. Now, what's powerful about that is whether I'm a client that's looking for the data, looking where to write the data, looking where to read the data, or if I'm the storage device itself, I don't have to go to a lookup table. I'm calculating that locally. Okay, So there's no, I don't have to go, hey, tell me where to put this. 
hey, go put it here. Okay, now I'm gonna go put it here. Hey, I put it there. You don't get all that traffic back and forth. I do that, I do that calculation locally, and that saves you on that round trip. So this is just showing you what that looks like when I've taken this object and put it across all my OSDs. More, more detail about what Crush does. Now, what happens when we're doing a read? Again, it doesn't do any sort of lookup. It calculates that locally on the client. But what happens when there's an outage? So before, my rules said I had to have one original, one copy, and that they couldn't be, for example, in the same host. Let's say this is one rack, this is another rack. So what's gonna happen is these OSDs talk to each other. So they talk to the guy next to him, say, hey, you still there? Hey, you still there? And then additionally, the pairs talk to each other. So these two guys say, hey, I know you've got my copy, are you still there? I know you got my copy, are you still there? And then also, every once in a while, the monitors will go out and say, hey, how's everybody doing? I haven't heard from you in a while. So through one of those mechanisms, the system finds out this guy's gone, whether that's a network issue, whether that's the drive just went bad. So this guy's gone. So right now, I only have one copy of my yellow and my red chunks. But immediately, without you doing anything, the system says, okay, you guys start moving stuff around. Again, this is calculated locally. I don't have to go to any sort of lookup and say, hey, I lost my copy, where do I put it now? It knows, my rules say that I've gotta have another copy that doesn't exist in this row. Here are the available devices, go put it there. And without any intervention of the user, the data just moves. So let's look at a, now, now the data, if it's gonna go do a read, it knows that it can fight at this other place. Because again, the, the monitor gets that updated map saying, hey, the copies are here, I can go there. So what happens when you add more storage? So now we've got the opposite issue, so instead of having a fail device, now I've got, I had an additional rack of storage. Well, again, it just rebalances. It calculates, okay, given my new set of rules and the new map of the available storage that I've got, how can I satisfy that and shuffle stuff around? Oh my God. So why is that important for cloud storage? Okay. So you've got one VM, the block device, hypervisor, we'll go again more into the architecture here. Because with the, with the, the block device that Ceph gives you, you can spin up hundreds of them with cloning. So this takes a little bit to draw. So here we've got your original block, okay? Now, with our instant copy, uh, let me go back to that. So now I've got my original four copies. Same amount of st storage. I've only used that original 144. Now, if there's a write, Ceph is smart enough to know that, hey, you only wrote to these five little, I mean, these four little chunks. So now, in addition to my original stripe of 144, I've got four extra. So it's not gonna rewrite that entire stripe. Now, when the client goes to read, it's smart enough to know, well, if this is a part that hasn't changed, I just pass that through, it goes right to the original. But if it's a chunk that's changed, well, yeah, I've got to read from here. But you see your total storage for this is only the, the delta plus the original. So, I, I mean, in this simple example that, that may not be that big of a difference, but again, if you imagine spinning up 100 of these and just having the delta, that's quite a storage savings. Now, how is Ceph integrated with CloudStack? Um, if you haven't heard of Vito Den Hollander, you, you probably should, shame on you. Um, he is active in the CloudStack community. He's a core committer. And I, I mean, I jokingly call this the house that Vito built, but this would not be here but for him. So he developed the, the Rados Java 
bindings. He did the plugins in libvirt. He put the logic into KVM QEMU. So all of this is credit to him. So let's go back to the overall Ceph architecture. We've got this underlying object store. Again, everything sits on this object store. Then the block device sits on top of this library. So we've got this series of bindings that we allow anyone to write any sort of uh, program that they want to directly access the object storage. So our RBD device is just an example where we did that internally. So we built our own block device that utilizes this library to then talk directly to the object storage. So libRBD talks to libRados, which gives you direct ag access to the object storage. But the overall structure of Ceph, the key components there, are the Rados gateway, which gives you S3 and Swift compatible access to the object store. And then again, the POSIX semantics for the file system. Now one thing I, I need to be clear about is that this, I'm not saying that you can have unified storage and that I can talk to the exact same object using each of these. So it's not that I can, I can access an object using the gateway, using the block device, or using CephFS. Those are different pools of data that you're gonna be accessing. But what it allows you to do is using the same underlying infrastructure, the object storage, allows you to have access to each of these features. So again, here's the specifics about the CloudStack integration. So as you're setting up a CloudStack cloud, the primary storage, you can go in and this is um, where I call the, the veto magic. Utilizing the QMU KVM and libvirt, you then talk to librbd. And so it's the, it's the CloudStack manager talking to, sending JSON commands out to the CloudStack agent that then converts those into libvirt calls. And those libvirt calls then talk to our librbd, which again, as I said on the previous one, then talks to that object storage underneath, passes that back up. So what do I need to do this? Well, if you're gonna use Ceph, you gotta have Ceph. So there's a download link, ceph.com. Our latest release, um, which should be coming out in, knock on wood, another couple weeks. It's, uh, we just had RC out last week. It, it's Firefly. Then you've got to have libvirt, uh, at least 091 or higher. Um, 123 just came out beginning of this month. Um, it's right there to download. And again, that, the libvirt allows you to pass those commands between the CloudStack KVM agent and our libRBD. In QEMOVE, and they, they're still in RC with 2.0. I'm not sure when that's supposed to go final, but 171 is out. And then, um, as I said, CloudStack, we've been integrated since 4.0, but if you want more of the advanced RBD features that I talked about, the cloning and such, that's really in uh, 4.2 or newer. So you can use 4.2 or 4.3. So what do you do? First step is you have to set up your Ceph cluster. And there's a quick start guide there that'll walk you through that, downloading the software, setting up your monitors, setting up your OSDs. Then once you've got that up and running, install and set up your QEMU. Same with libvirt. Then on Ceph, create your, your pool that you're gonna use for your CloudStack storage. So this is just a Ceph command, so a Ceph OSD pool create cloud stack. It's that simple. Then, just like you would with any other primary storage, go to your cloud stack administrator GUI, add primary storage, and then for your protocol, select RBD. And RBD stands for Rados Block Device. So we've got acronyms of acronyms. So Rados is your Reliable Autonomous Distributed Object Store. You can say that mouthful. So that's, Rados is the object storage. 
So then you take Rados block device, and that's where the RBD comes from. Now, I'm gonna go back one, oh, right here. One thing I skipped over here is the secondary storage. So th with the cloud stack, S3 can speak S3. The Ceph object gateway um, speaks both S3 and Swift. So those are compatible, and you can use that for secondary storage. Okay, I want to spend a little time at the end here talking about what's next for Ceph and why some of these are pretty exciting. In the Firefly release, we're going to have cache tiering, erasure coding, and object quotas. The first two, I think, are really exciting for use cases. So cache tiering, if you've got a write back cache. So for your object storage, you can have clients that with the front end of, let's say, you want to have spinning disks for your entire five petabyte cluster, but you can't afford to have five, five petabyte of flash in your system. Although, if you do, I'd like to talk to you afterwards. Um, but 500 terabytes could be a reasonable front end, and you want to make sure that you're getting good throughput on your writes. So you're going to write to the cache, and then, based upon the cache rules you set up, the cache is going to push that stuff off. So think of this as a hot to warm. So you're pushing it from hot to warm. And then this is a feature that is, is not fully ready in, or fully tested in Firefly, but um, will probably be it, the capabilities there, but we're not sure if we've totally satisfied every corner case. So we're not going to say it's ready until probably giant. But this is a read only. So you've got the opposite problem here. I don't want to buffer reads from a customer. Say, let's say I've got um, some sort of a content distribution network. And so I want to make sure that they're getting as much read throughput as possible. So I put my flash cache on the front end. And I can either pre-stage stuff or I can say, hey, once someone has accessed that, pull it up there and leave it there until I start to fill up. And then you can push it back down. And as far as um, size-wise, the, the feature that is biggest for us in Firefly is erasure coding. Erasure coding is the same uh, math magic that makes RAID 5, RAID 6 work. One of the biggest um, kind of digs on Ceph in the past has been, OK, fine, you say I can do it with commodity storage. But if I'm not relying upon the smarts of the RAID and the hardware to save my data, how am I saving it? It's with replication. So instead of, <laughs> instead of having one copy of my data that's rated. Now I've got, I've got to basically buy three times the usable store, storage to ensure that my data is safe. So where's that cost benefit? Maybe it's worth, me, worth it to me to pay more for a big EMC chassis as opposed to three HPs. So in this scenario, you've got a, I've got a 10, 10 meg object. To ensure my, my data retention and quality, I've got one original and then two copies. So we, we call that three times replication. So you've got three times the original size. So I've had to pay for 30 to really get 10 usable. Now with erasure coding, what you do using Reed Solomon or other erasure codes, you just split it up using the chunks, using math. And basically, there's various K plus M values that you can set up that allow you to say, hey, as long as I've got this many, let's say I chop it up into 14 chunks, as long as I've got 10 of those, then I can, I can rebuild my data if anything goes wrong. So I've got my original 10 plus um, four parity, just like your RAID, RAID 5, RAID 6. So what happens in this case is before I had to have 30 megs of storage to really get 10 usable, now I only have to have 14 megs to get 10 usable. The, the, the original 10 for my data, and then the, the four to provide parity. And that's coming out in Firefly. So what's, what's next? Um, if, you're, if you're interested in finding out more about Ceph, the, the docs are pretty, pretty detailed and pretty good there. You can um, go peruse those. We've got some juju. You can go play with it on AWS. 
Um, the Ansible playbooks are a new thing that we, we just started within the last month. We've got a lot of traction on using Ansible to set it up. And then we've got a manual quick start guide if you wanna just get up and running and um, not too long. If you decide, hey, I wanna actually contribute, there's our GitHub information. Um, we'd love to have you, we're really active on IRC. And um, if you wanna check out the bugs or if you wanna fix a bug or something, feel free to look on there. So I apologize, I have no idea what the time is with all those technical difficulties. I've tried to not fly through too much, but I, do we have some time for questions? Yeah, we got about five minutes. One minute, all right, man. Yeah, what was your name? Okay, the questions were, okay, since we have S3, do we have ACLs, access control lists on it? And then the second question was, can I front Ceph with iSCSI, right? Okay, um, we do have ACLs. We have um, bucket level ACLs for the, the Rados gateway. And as far as fronting it with iSCSI, um, we have a TGT plugin. So you can use um, TGT to then plug in access uh, iSCSI to TGT to RBD. Yes, that's all open source. Yeah. Um, okay, speaking as my community member hat, I'd say, yeah, go out and play with it, it's great. Um, Wearing my director of engineering at Ink Tank hat, we're not ready to support it. Um, again, they're, when we say not production ready, that just means that we're not sure of the stability of it and we don't want anyone to lose data. There are people um, in various places that are running it in production. There's a um, pretty active group in China that's running it with multi MDS servers and are having no problems. So basically right now it's bulletproofing corner cases we just wanna make sure that it's really to what we consider a supportable standard, which our goal right now is Q4 this year to be able to say that the file system is production supportable. Yeah. Ooh, okay, the question was, have we implemented any performance gating? Yeah, QoS on volumes, we have not implemented any QoS. That's on our roadmap, but we have not done it. Okay, I want to be fair to time, even though I stole a little bit with my Wi-Fi issues, so thanks for your time. If you have questions, I'll be over here, and um, if you want, I've got just a handful of swag that they sent me, so feel free to come over and grab a shirt or a sticker or something. Thanks for your time. <laughs>